I grew up with folklore. I grew up believing in fairies and vampires and ghosts and shapeshifters and magic and witches and, you know, folklore. And what if, and maybe perhaps. With, um, with writing Wicked Lovely, I came here to Balboa Park. And I took a lot of pictures, and I had a journal, and I took notes on architecture that struck me, like here, with all the wonderful metal, and the plants, and the greenery, and people, the way they walked, uh, their interaction, their hair, the flow of their clothes. The, the very first scene I actually wrote for Wicked Lovely um, was written at the fountain here outside the Fleet Science Center. And, um, and it's a sort of amalgamation of that and the koi pond, which is um, right behind the courtyard we're hanging out in. And in Wicked Lovely, the, um, the antagonist is, is pushing for and is succeeding at creating eternal winter. And what I wanted um, was, you know, victory being this, vic victory being San Diego. Um, and so the entire environment here um, represents that for me. Ink Exchange is about the consequences of the resolution of Wicked Lovely. It's not a sequel, um, it's a companion novel. So the characters that we meet that are peripheral characters in Wicked Lovely become to the central characters that come to the forefront in Ink Exchange. And it's, um, it's the dark court, it's the court of nightmares and terrors, it's, um, it's dealing with addiction, it's, um, there's some ugly stuff in it, and um, it's, it's um, it was horrible to write at times. It's about uh, a girl who decides that um, she's going to join the tribe of the Mark. She's going to get a tattoo to commemorate claiming her body. Um, and she has some unexpected consequences from getting that. And, uh, and it's about a, a fairy who is doing what he can to save his people. And it's about another fairy who is um, pretty wrapped up in his past and um, choices that he feels that he could have maybe done better and wants to save the girl. Like Wicked Lovely, it's a bunch of people with competing agendas and um, hopefully they, they can make it through to the other side. Now this whole thing about my fairies being scary, and um, fairies are scary. Um, that's, the, that's the way of it. Um, if you look at the old lore, you look at the true lore, it's, it's not this disnified. Um, it's, it's not sweet. Our, our children know the world is not sweet and safe and perfect. I mean, it's just not. And folklore enables us, and all, speculative fiction in general, enables us to take these, um, to take these dangerous realities and, and cast them in, in a framework where we can talk about things that aren't always comfortable. And so when I started writing, it never occurred to me to write sweet and cuddly fairies because I don't believe that there are such a thing. I guess I don't think of it as make-believe. I, I really, until you prove to me that they aren't real, I'm okay with believing they are. We all are in the middle of stories. And so picking just one of them to tell his or her story just never appeals to me in the same way that having several characters who come together and we get their different threads. And um, it's, the sort of, it's the sort of multiple narrative Robert Browning theory where, where truth um, meaning is in the space between the lines, it's not in the line.